a very juvenile response, emotional response there. Mm. Um, and Rossman's work in 1996 on cognitive appraisal, it suggests that certain appraisal components, so the um, what we receive from people, in whether it be verbal, non-verbal, or physical responses, um, elicit different emotions when they interact in the social spectrum. So I'm going to pop up the spectrum itself. It's over two slides. Um, oh, no, wait, compasses first. My bad. <laughs> um, so compasses are the individual behaviours, routines, responses, or skills that come under one of the eight social cognitive domains. Um, and there's elaborations of these in the domain. Um, during certain phases, competencies are not apparent. This is due to an inability to express or demonstrate these competencies until a later phase. So an example of this is our sexuality domain, where really the ability to interact with others sexually or even acknowledge that you're sexually attracted to someone is not apparent whatsoever. Um, but if we were to go back to Freud's theories, of, there is the fixations, but we didn't really cover those because they're we didn't seem to think they were entirely relevant in this context. Um, and some competencies in this model are influenced or characterised by concepts raised by other theorists, which we will bring up. Um, before I go on, any questions at all? Yep. All good. All right. So this is the first four domains, communication, organisation, sexuality, and peer interaction. Um, it's cut off a bit, but along the top we've got our conceptual, individual, institutional, organisation, and societal um, spaces. So um, we, if we look at communication here, so as we see, a uh, person in that phase will communicate by using cries or do noise talking to communicate. And then when we get up to the societal phase, they master advanced principles of their native language in a written, in written communication. Um, they are able to interpret, interpret complex communication in regards to paralanguage, which is how things are said. Um, I think we need one, uh, another one on the end for post-smartphone, where it goes in reverse. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Good comment. Oh, okay. Where, where, where's the smart? Oh. The, the spelling and everything's going backwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one more, one more column. Yeah. Post smartphone yeah. and internet. Mm, mm, mm. And iPads as well. <laughs> yeah, and that that's actually something like other work I've looked at <laughs> is like I, I've done some teaching placements and you just look at the spelling that yeah. the students have and you just like. Oh, right, let's learn how to write a sentence. Back, back to grade one basics here. You're all in year 11 and don't know how to write. But as you can see across this, our, the compasses grow. There tends to be more, generally there's more as you go across each one. So if we just look at our conceptual phase going down, we use crying or noise talk to communicate and show awareness of their parents and siblings for organisation. Sexuality does not show any awareness of sexual identity. And play, they engage in play with themselves, really, because they're just mm. like... Yeah, they're not socialising. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the weekend, I was at my goddaughter's first birthday, and, like, she'll, she'll just, like, you could be doing something with her, and she'll just be off doing her own thing alongside. Mm. Um, when we get to individual level, um, here's an example, I'll actually draw up here. So this here's an example of something that we borrowed from Piaget. Demonstrates in a monologue where um, you might have like a group of children all sitting in a circle talking, but when you actually pay attention, they're not really, they're not really talking to anyone but themselves. Um, they start responding to basic paralanguage, they understand when a parent is angry or happy, 
Um, there's limited verbal communication. They're just beginning to learn how to speak English and form sentences. And there is a reliance on non-verbal gesture-based cues to communicate, like that, that, I want that kind of, yeah, uh, the, yeah uh, that kind uh, of, yeah. yeah. Um, in organisation, oh. awkward. <laughs> well, well, Oopsie, where did the bell go? We've lost power. What it's did you break out. this time? Uh, <laughs> oh. Oops. We had a power surge. Oh, can just continue on mm. with the dark. Better black and coming. <laughs> um. Oh, oh here we go. We're back. This is what happens. Do I have to turn it back on? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, by the wall. Oh. <coughs> okay, well that organisation. Oh, I'm going to just sit down for a second. <sighs> oh, any second now. I think it's broken. I feel like we're going to You guys all enjoying it so far? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Great. Um, yeah, you guys have my um, trial run basically for us to make this for publication. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, here we go. It's coming back up. Yay! Don't forget spell check now. Oh, I know. Oh, <laughs> you press F7 for that. Oh, <laughs> actually, <laughs> the actual <laughs> research paper itself I passed on to one of my co workers because her nickname's the Grandma. And the grammar and formatting Nazi, so she's looking through it all for me here. Yeah. Um, so, individual organisational phase um, competencies, they demonstrate an understanding of simple relationship structures and basic hierarchy structures. So, um, a simple relationship structure is there's mum, dad, me, siblings, and maybe dog, cat, fish in there. And then looking at the yeah. Yeah. Look, well, if we look at the hierarchy, like the hierarchy, what I'll do is I'll actually bring up a separate slide to show you. So, thank you. Okay. So, in our relationship structures, what they see is like there's how do I make the pen small? That one. Yeah, the smaller one, no. The smaller dot. The small, small dot. dot. The small dot. The small, small dot. dot. That? Yeah. Okay, so we go. They got family, mm -hmm. and what they see is you got parents, your siblings, and maybe like grandparents, <coughs> what's that? Grandpa, and self. So that's what they perceive as the organisation of the relationships. And then the looking at the basic hierarchy, they can determine that, you know, you got mum, dad, and then kids like that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's pr um and you know like just adding on, you know, this is um, GM and then Grandad. So it's very simple, very linear, mm. Mm. almost like a almost like a family tree. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Go back to that one there. Um, uh, then sexuality. This is as we, as I said earlier. This is where they demonstrates subconscious desires that they don't act upon sexually so it's really about the they don't have the bits ready there yet but they're starting to identify them what age is this um so this is around two bob. <coughs> two bob okay my bad something's actually happened to this here that's not right so okay um zero to two um, 
five to ten. It's up the top where you can't see it. Like you is said, it? there was more to yeah. it. Oh, it is two, yeah. It's yeah. Two. Sorry, five to um, is up there. I actually, is five to ten. I made a copying error on this. I have given you a copy of this. Um, so, actually, it should say in this phase here, there shouldn't be really any awareness of sexual identity. This is, this is where formatting is a nightmare, copying from Word to PowerPoint. So, sorry, I'll just cross that out there. That should be there. Um, Does not show any aware awareness of sexual. Yeah, so at that stage, they really have no clue about sexual orientation. Or yeah, between like the age of two and five. Yeah. Um, then they move into um, our play and peer interaction. They demonstrate self-directed play. They can, you know, they see blocks of Lego, they're like, okay, I'm just going to play with Lego. They see toys, I'm going to play with these toys kind of thing. Um, they demonstrate really unstructured group play, so they might be doing, it, they might be in a group of five kids, two of them do something, three of them do another thing, but they're all kind of playing in the group, but not really doing all the same thing at once. Mm -hmm. Um, and they engage in part of the stages of play. So these include um, unoccupied. I do have proper definitions of these in here. Hopefully, I should do. Bear with me one second, I can actually tell you what they are. Okay, unoccupied play is really playing with once, playing alone, just doing your own thing when you feel like it. Um, solitary is very independent, so I'm gonna, so an example of this is if you look at children playing with Lego blocks, they've got some form of internal structure that they're doing, but they're really doing it on their own. Onlooker play is where you have a group of children playing, but another child on the side will look at what they're doing and start mimicking that. Um, parallel play is a similar concept, but it's where two groups of children will play games side by side, but not exactly the same game. And associative play is where they start, start contributing to each other's activities that they're doing, but still doing their own thing, and then cooperative plays where they're all playing together the same game. Um, so that pretty much covers this, um, this part of the spectrum. Um, though what I will touch on is understanding like the complex relationships and structures. So if I go back to the, see what we had here. Mm -hmm. What I'll do, so this is the very simple one. If we move to the complex end of the spectrum, it ends up looking something like this. So there's me, fam, parents, grandparents, siblings, um, aunts, Uncles, cousins, pets, friends, co-workers, acquaintances, and it just keeps branching out and out and out, so it's very complex. And then when we look at it on like a hierarchical structure, we move away from that whole, um, you know, like mum, dad kind of thing, uh, because they're more so in a societal setting or an organisational setting, and it begins to sort of look something like this. We go me, we go up, and there's like, you know, boss, then maybe across here there's the PA for the boss, up here, the boss's boss. You know, it just keeps going up and then yeah. it branches off into the family, mm -hmm. the family structure, the friend structure, and it's a very 
it, it's basically a viewpoint of where they sit in society in relation to work, school, university, whatever, family. So, yeah. So, so that's more like a relationship web type. The, yeah. The so one on the left. What's that? The um, one on the left. The one on the left. Yeah, it's about the. Uh, it's about they understand c complex relationship structures. Yes. The one on the right is more so about they understand complex hierarchical structures. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, if you keep going on and on and on with this, it will end up being going <coughs> to, like, the Prime Minister, basically, yeah. because um, the CEO of a company still has to, mm. is mm. still kind of in society, regulated by, you know, mm. parliamentarians or a board or whatever, so, mm. yeah, it, it just keeps going on and on, and it's, it's kind of like one of those three degrees of separation kind of things mm. that we've got going on here. I will wipe off the board. We're almost done, so yep, cool. Next one is yes, we're on it. Okay, there shouldn't be any problems with this here. Okay, so perspective. They don't really demonstrate any observed perspective domain competencies when they're born. Nothing that we really could record apart from the whole that's mum, that's dad kind of thing. Um, when they hit the individual phase, they have that egocentric thought going on where they consider their perspectives to be focused internally on themselves. So I'm the centre of the universe kind of thing. And that's one thing, that's once again something we borrowed from Piaget. Institutional level, they perceive we have the influence of stereotypes. So, um, so difficult to give a good example of this without, you know, offending someone because that's the problem with stereotypes. But the best best way that we were able to describe it is um, is like you know um, uh, people who identify as Christian go to church on a Sunday. So that that's how they perceive others. I'm not going to call my friend because on to see if he wants to come over on Sunday because he's a Christian and he'll go to church. That's the kind of thing that we're aiming for there. Um, we understand others but have a different perspective. We can only attempt to generalise these um, in a sense that, ooh, mum's mad because I did something. I don't know exactly why she's mad, but she is. When we get to organisational phase, they start demonstrating egocentrism again, but in an adolescent context, where it's everyone judging me, kind of. Yeah. Um, they also apply abstract reasoning, so this is, the, these two points here, we really borrowed from Piaget's work, because adolescence egocentrism, and also abstract reasoning, um, that way they're able to perceive what others may think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and they also start developing their ability to be impartial. And when they hit the societal phase, they really are still demonstrating stuff in the organisational phase here. But, but what they're doing as well is they're demonstrating their ability to act impartial in all circumstances. And very few people are able to actually achieve that because there's a lot of bias going on in their lives. Um, Culture, we start off with, they don't really demonstrate any cultural domain competencies because culture is something that is, has to be learned. Um, when they hit individual, they start applying the culture to their identity development and it leads all the way up to them developing cliques and having the desire to lead with um, le different levels of responsibility, also their response to instructions as well. Um, it, we witnessed in this particularly because of the difference in cultural protocols between different cultures. Um, then when they reach the societal phase, what they do is they kind of go, yep, yeah, no, more, no more cliques that we associate with. We've more so developed these discourses that we associate ourselves with, so... Um, Can you explain that a little bit? Okay, so when we think of cliques, we think in high school, like, um, they're the cool kids, they're the geeks, they're the nerds, they're the jocks kind of thing. Um, and what we do when we hit a societal phase is we kind of get rid of those labels and we look at it more from the perspective of I'm a student, I'm a student studying this, or I'm a worker and stuff like that. So we associate 
more so with societal references rather okay. than yep. um, the nitty gritty personality type things. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting in this is we noticed mm -hmm. down here they in their institutional phase of primary school they've got this desire for leadership with no real responsibility. We see this a lot with the uh, lines and stuff at school. They want to be at the top of the line because they're leading the line. There's no real responsibility attached to that. When they hit organisational phase, there's still a bit of a desire to lead and that's but with limited responsibility. When they hit the societal phase, this kind of drops off a bit. They there's a limited desire to lead. Um, but only to lead with full responsibility. So this is where we see people you know, engaging as head of communities or head of businesses and stuff like that. So um, identity develops, um, and as you'll notice, we've got quite a few of Ericsson's existential questions posed in here. So from the very first, I think that is who they can trust in the world, and then ends up at um, with, with this one here, we've said that they're identifying to at least one of these questions. So, who they can love, um, can they make their life count, or is it okay to be me? And these were a bit of a nightmare to actually observe in people without having to directly question them, mm -hmm. which can mm -hmm. skew the results. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we did is we looked at, at a bit of a retrospective stance and it was like, well, who can I love? People are starting to engage in sexual relationships. There, you know, um, a, a good example of it is people feeling comfortable to hold their partner's hand in public and stuff like that. That's where we're really able to identify stuff like that through external stimuli. So, so it was tricky to get it, but Ericsson really provided our baseline for this. Because um, yeah, there's a massive cultural influence on that. <coughs> mm, mm. Mm. And um, like the cultural influence that we see, so like with who can I love, it, that, that's definitely a really big one because different cultures have different protocols based on that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, even though there are tie, cultural ties to each question, we can still propose each question yeah. as kind of like a generic mm. um, this is what they're thinking about, kind of, in their social cognition abilities. We get to emotion, um, which is our final domain. So we go down to the conceptual end. They react with polar emotions, you know, cry or laugh. All the way up to the societal end, which is they're accepting consequences for individual actions. Um, they rationalise how to avoid consequences in the future. Um, in saying that, we're hoping that they're rationalising how to avoid getting themselves into trouble from what they did to not do that action again, not think, right, I robbed that bank, how can I get away with it this time kind of approach. <laughs> um, so, so there's a bi there's a bipolar problem happening there? Yeah. Is that the case usually? Yeah, so it's really about ethical kind of, oh, right, that wasn't the right thing to do, I won't do it in future, or if there's something I need to do but it's caused a problem, I will do it differently to ensure it doesn't cause a problem in the future. So that's why they're put in jail for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and demonstrates emotions as dictated wholly by our social protocols. And as we can see, it kind of develops as they go along here. So before that, if they get into trouble, they question the consequences. They, they may accept part of the consequence, but they still question it. And so what we see is, like, particularly teenagers, where they're like, oh, but this person does it and they don't get in trouble. It's sort of like one of those things that we see. Right, what we're going to move on to is applications and counselling. Um, so four things I've identified. Um, it helps us understand level of development for referral. It's useful for considering social abilities of clients and family therapy. Knowing the factors that may impact the counselling session and provide a baseline for counselling clients with presenting social concerns. Alright, so first of all, development of referral. So I take it everyone here has done the referring clients unit mm. so far or working on it or mm. working towards it? Yeah. 
So it's very similar to if we had a client with a developmental issue or a mental health issue. Yes. If it is outside our ability and scope to deliver a service to them, we need to know what we can do to help them. Um, so in this example, I said we've got an adult who's functioning at an individual phase, so what would it expect from toddlers really? Yes. Um, therefore, it is appropriate for us to refer to a specialist because they wouldn't have the correct skills to, in we wouldn't have the correct skills to interact with them in a way that we would with another client. Um, so we can understand the level of social cognition using a SAR, Spectrum Assessment Rubric, which I've given you guys a copy of. This one? Yep, that one there. You don't have a word for Yeah, I do. I can. Yeah. So, with this, what it works on is you can work out what level of each domain they're functioning at, and it's just basically a case of ticking what they've demonstrated. And the one that's got the most, if you got like, for example, if all organisational squares are ticked, then obviously they're functioning at an organisational level. Whereas if they've got two in the individual phase and two in the institutional phase, you would tend to go a bit more towards the higher um, level. Um, and then what you do is you work to find out the overall levels, you work down and you kind of like tally up how many ticks there are for each, comp uh, for each phase, how many ticks are in the competency boxes there are for each phase, and you kind of total it up. The one that's got the most ticks across it is the level that they're really demonstrating at, so it's one of those majority rules kind of things in this. Um, and it's just a case of you only tick it if you see them demonstrating it. Mm -hmm. it but then again, like, Let's say they're understanding, you, you don't tick it leading up to the one they're at, you just tick the one that they're at. So they're demonstrating uh, basic understanding of hierarchies and social structures, uh, you tick that, but if they're demonstrating like the basics of a complex one, hierarchy or relationship structure, you'll tick the basic complex box rather than the basic one. Okay. Yep. Um, you can also ask, use questionnaires that relate to social cognition, um, conduct observations, which for counsellors isn't really a practical approach because it is something that it would take a while to look at. I mean, like the observations I did for this was over four years in different environments and contexts. Yeah. Um, or you can rely on external documentation, so like you can get family, friends, co-workers, bosses, or in the case yeah, of school children, teachers, maybe. school teachers, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean like, um, I myself, I've got Asperger's Syndrome, it took several years to diagnose me with it, but what they did is each time I would visit the paediatrician, my school teacher would have a like written report about what she's witnessed of me in class. Yeah, it's ASD now. What's that? It's ASD. Yeah, it's ASD. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Isn't it's it? like, let's just screw everything around. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, it's useful for considering the le different levels of social cognition in family therapy. So, as we've said, um, fam if I'm doing this unit at the moment, it's driving me nuts. <laughs> um, but a family will have people on all different levels of the spectrum. And one of the things that some therapists suggest is that the communication trade sections within the family yeah. are not going through fully and we can explain this because there are different levels of social cognition going on here yeah, and right. they don't know how to exactly interact with each other. Yeah, so that's, that's the passive aggressive teenager. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. so what we can do is we can build an understanding of the abilities of each family member of social cognition. Um, then we can run sessions that work to be inclusive of all the different levels and yeah. also make the family understand where people are differently positioned at to help them work through their issues in the therapy. Mm -hmm. um, our next step, <coughs> provide a baseline for counselling clients with presenting social concerns. So 
you can use therapies including um, solution focused narrative cognitive behavioral therapy um, in the handouts I gave you there is actually a kind of an overview of the different therapies that you can apply to the different social uh, cognitive domains mm -hmm. to help them develop um, it's it has been constructed from a theoretical standpoint mm -hmm. and it needs much more testing on it mm -hmm. to be deemed accurate in this sense but it kind of provides a baseline of what could be applied based on what the therapies are predominantly used for. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So because that's what you that's what you want. Yeah. It's good to identify, but then how do you move mm. forward from there and help these people develop? Yeah. Um, so we can help client build their social cognitive competency related to their concern from the phase they are in to the next phase. So, for example, our concern is the client has difficulty communicating with others. Um, they're deemed to be communicating at an institutional phase, but they the rest of their social cognition is at like an organisational phase, and they want to improve their communication skills. So what we could do is we can undertake therapy over a uh, multiple sessions, so for communication we could use uh, PCT, CBT, and just dull, solution focused, existential or interpersonal psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. We could apply one of those, so for example CBT, um, if we were to use that it's about changing the thought process mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. applying it to the actions yep. so they're, they're able to stop, think what they're going to say and then say it and slowly building themselves up to transition into the next phase because they're developing those skills through changing their thought process. Um, the outcome is they're now demonstrating uh, the organisational phase of communication and we end up having a happy client. Yeah. Um, oh, yep, okay, and then applications in counselling. The last one, knowing the factors that may impact the counselling session, so we understand that, you know, outbursts, violent behaviour, <coughs> um, unwillingness to participate, they can be factors that impact it. But with, this is very limited, I mean like this list could cover this whole entire screen, mm -hmm. but these are just a few examples here. So adolescence egocentrism, this is a, uh, coming from doing secondary teaching, something you've really got to watch for because the whole, everyone's judging me, everyone's, you know, thinking about what I'm wearing and stuff like that. You've got to be really considerate with this. So if you make a statement or challenge a client who's demonstrating adolescence egocentrism, that could impact the session because then they'll go, oh, I'm not going to say anything anymore because they're judging me and I don't want to be judged kind of thing. So we can use, we can kind of use that to go, well, how do we challenge the client in appropriate manner so they still participate but we're not impacting the flow of the session. Mm -hmm. And what did you teach? Um, <coughs> I've taught 7 to 12. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I've also worked in the OSH sector, so outside school hours care with primary school students and I currently develop curriculum resources for um, adult and vocational ed. Jeez, you've cool. been around, eh? Yeah. <laughs> um, limited communication skills because, you know, it's a nightmare trying to communicate with someone if you, if there's a limit on their communication abilities. Mm -hmm. So this is a case where we would terminate the session and refer them to a counsellor who's more specialised for that. Um, just one question. What yeah. about if a person's got a, um, a hearing impairment? Okay, hearing impairment. Um, could work ways around that, like um, sign language. Yeah, sign language, or you know, using visual cues, or um, I'm just trying to think, uh, like whiteboards or stuff like that too. What about if they've got a vision loss as well? Is there like some sort of um, technology?